I'm going to run through quite a complicated field in a relatively short period of time. Um, I'm not assuming that at the end of it you'll feel expert necessarily, but I hope that you'll have a bit more information uh, to at least be able to understand some of the obligations um, that, that sit with the ownership and operation of uh, refrigeration systems. So, the, broadly speaking, we're going to try and address three, three general questions. When must standards be applied? When must guidance be applied? And when must regulations be applied? Now, there's a kind of an obvious answer to that that could say I can sit down now and you can get on with life, which is always and everywhere. But there are nuances within uh, that kind of very simple and broad brush uh, answer. And I'm hoping to kind of just put a bit of detail on, on those nuances for you. So uh, a former colleague who's now retired once sat down and worked out all of the regulations and standards that apply to refrigeration uh, and heat pump systems and installations. And they ran to something like, if I remember, roughly 45 different sets of regulations and standards that applied across the field in general. You'll be glad to hear I'm not going to address all of those, but I'm going to look in a little bit of detail at uh, four regulations um, and uh, looking at two uh, uh, specific standards. Uh, with regards to, does this apply to my refrigeration system because it's, it's ammonia? Uh, absolutely. Does it apply because it's non-ammonia? Well, it might in part. So, there's some elements of these regulations which cover any type of fridge system um, and there are some which are a little bit more specific to the question of whether or not in, in terms of the refrigerant is it flammable, is it toxic or, or, or otherwise. So uh, I'll let you judge whether or not any of these regulations apply to the stuff that you're looking at. I want to talk initially about the pressure equipment regulations. Um, this is uh, the, the kind of design standard for pressure envelopes that, uh, that any refrigeration system needs to meet. Um, and in very simple terms, PER is the UK's implementation of the Pressure Equipment Directive. Um, it's a whole massive subject all in its own right, but in very simple terms. And the reason we're highlighting these particular points is because in the work that my team does, and my team is the technical advisory arm of the business and we do a lot of consultancy work and we look at a lot of rusty pipe work and we look at a lot of pressure vessels, uh, these particular issues are ones that come out uh, fairly regularly. So PER applies to new installations for sure. It also applies potentially to existing installations where you're making a significant change to that. And the first key point to make is that all components, and that's all the bits and pieces that make up that, uh, that, that system. Um, must have a CE certificate and BCE mark. Now, any of you who are involved in procuring equipment will know that, yes, that's how most things come. If I buy a pump, I can go and look at its, its uh, little tally plate, and within there somewhere there'll be a CE mark that will you know, give me the, the comfort and the knowledge that this has been designed in accordance with the regulation that that CE mark applies to. And we're talking specifically here about pressure equipment uh, standards. So if you buy a, a pressure vessel, be it a heat exchanger or a surge drum or whatever, you should go looking for the tally plate. And yes, it ought to have the, the CE mark. Um, a really important factor, which I, w I would hope for most people is, again, an obvious one, but I've come across instances where both in terms of new equipment and also in terms of existing plant, there isn't what's called a global certificate, CE certificate and EC mark. What that means is that people have been buying the components, uh, and I'm talking about end users and contractors that I've worked with, other, other refrigeration contractors that we've worked with, and in assembling that plant and saying that's great, it's good to go with regards to the pressure equipment regulations because I bought the vessel CE stamped. The key point to make is that, that in addition to the elements, the components, the complete system must also be evaluated and must have its own global certificate of conformity. And if it doesn't have that, then legally you're not allowed to run that plant. Um, and as I say, you might be surprised to hear that we have come across instances where that situation actually existed. And this was planned in some cases that had already been put into use and was running. So all the components need to be CE marked and the system itself needs to be evaluated. So who's allowed to do the evaluation? 
It's not, well, it could be the contractor themselves, but only under certain circumstances, or it needs to be uh, a notified body like Lloyd's or uh, Bureau Veritas or one of these organizations who will come and do that assessment for you. So that's PER, that's the kind of key thing, message we want to put across with regards to pressure equipment regulations. Most <coughs> contractors that are out there operating understand that, but not all, and that's important, uh, an important factor that people need to, uh, to be aware of. And I want to talk about PS PSSR, which is pressure system safety regulations, and PUER, which is uh, the provision and use of, of work equipment regulations 1998. So what, where does this regulation sit in this kind of pantheon of, of uh, regulations that, that, uh, that we have to adhere to? Well, this is one that applies to equipment that's in service. So your plant has been designed and built and installed and commissioned and set to work. Uh, the pressure equipment regulations have been met along with all the other uh, regulations that might apply uh, to bringing this plant into use. But once this plant is in and up and running, this particular regu regulation, PSSR, is the one that apply. it applies to all uh, refrigeration systems with some specific kind of uh, caveats that might, might uh, exclude it. It's specifically focused on stored energy, so it's a regulation that's there to uh, protect against uh, effectively explosions, the release, uh, 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 uncontrolled release of energy from a, from a refrigeration system. Um, it doesn't apply to every single fridge system. It doesn't apply to smaller systems where the stored energy is considered not to be significant enough to cause harm should, uh, you know, sh should there be a, a, an incident where there is an uncontrolled release. So again, someone sat down somewhere or a committee sat down somewhere and, and drew a, a line that said below this, you don't need to adhere to PSSR specifically, although there are other regulations that potentially come into effect anyway, but a, a refrigeration system where the compressor motor power is less than 25 kilowatts doesn't apply. If it's above that, it, it does apply. And obviously it also applies where you've got, a, a, it needs to have a pressure vessel above a certain rating. And that rating is 250 bar liters, which is not a very big pressure vessel in, in absolute terms. So really any system with a compressor drive motors over 25 kilowatts and with really any sort of reasonable pressure vessel on it bigger than probably five or ten litres in size. So a small oil pot uh, will, will come into, uh, into the frame here. And what the requirement of the, system, the, the regulation is that you need to have a written scheme of examination. So someone needs to sit down and say, OK, I'm going to inspect this system on a regular basis. And here is the written scheme against which the system is going to be inspected. And then the system needs to be inspected in accordance with that, with that written scheme. And there's a couple of other important aspects to bear in mind. Whilst it's a regulation that applies to the in-service uh, systems, there is, a, the, the, there is a requirement that the first inspection is actually completed before refrigerant is charged into the system. That actually doesn't happen, I suspect, in the vast majority of installations. Uh, that, that, that I'm aware of. Most systems very often get put into service and away they go and then people go, oh, we need a, we need a written scheme to go with that. The, the regulation, if you read it, the, the code of practice that goes with it requires that written scheme and that first inspection to be done uh, prior to charging refrigerant into the system. Um, and the requirement, again, it's a kind of vague sort of term, but it, it has uh, specific requirements built into it, that the, the written scheme and the inspection should be done by a competent person. Now, that can be a person within the organization itself, or it might be a, somebody that you brought in from outside. And then in addition to that, there's a requirement within the regulation to test the safety systems that go with that. So that would be high pressure cutouts and ensuring that pressure relief valves are in date and so on and so forth. And then the provision and use of work equipment regulations is an additional little one that it kind of has crept up on us relatively recently, but encompasses um, the requirement to inspect not just the pressure vessels. Very often when you get hold of a written scheme, you'll read it, and it, it only identifies the vessels as the bits that are going to be inspected, and very often says piping is not relevant. But, excuse me, I'll just go back. <coughs> 
Um, but there is under uh, PUER a requirement uh, where the, the pipework contains toxic or flammable substances that there must be an inspection regime that goes with that as well. And that also must be documented by a competent person. We see both of these, these regulations as actually just aligning into one document package, but it's important that that whole system is addressed. And again, one of the issues that we've come across over the last few years is that very often uh, that isn't the case. In, in many cases, the insurance companies will look at the pressure vessels, but then disregard the rest. And I'm talking specifically here about ammonia systems, because that's probably the one where most people will come across the toxic or potentially flammable issue. Um, that there, that there isn't then an inspection regime associated with the pipework that goes with that. So, um, on to flammability. Andy mentioned uh, the kind of the range of refrigerants that are out there and the issues that uh, uh, arise with some of them. Um, EN378, which is the refrigeration uh, safety standard, um, classifies all refrigerants under four classifications in terms of flammability. They're either non-flammable, um, they have lower flammability, so there was this 2L classification for the likes of ammonia and the HFO refrigerants that are coming onto the market at the moment. There is flammable and then there's highly flammable. And again, just to give you a quick flavour of what that means in terms of non-flammable, the ones that you would recognise as synthetics like R22, 134A, uh, carbon dioxide. Lower flammability is the likes of ammonia, which uh, stands alone in terms of its... Uh, uh, its uniqueness, the 1234YF and ZEs are the new HFOs that are being brought to market and R32 is in fact an HFC but it is a, has a lower flammability rating. 152 is the flammable and then the likes of propane, butane and propylene. So what, does, what do the regulations have to say with regards to flammability of refrigerants? So there is the dangerous substances and explosive atmosphere regulations is the one that I want to address here. Um, says that if your refrigerant is non-flammable, this regulation does not apply. It then says, with regards to everything else, whether it's low flammability, flammable or higher flammability, this regulation applies. And again, this is another one of these regulations that's been around since uh, 2002, 15 years, but I think it's only relatively recently in the last four, five, six years that our industry has woken up to the fact that there's this regulation that sits out there that actually applies to, uh, well, certainly to ammonia. It applies, yes, absolutely, to the hydrocarbons. And oh, by the way, if you're looking at HFOs as the silver bullet to your problem with regards to phasing out of synthetic refrigerants, they are classified as lower flammability and disease applies here as well. And you need to uh, take account of that when you're looking at putting this system in. So what does that mean in terms of taking account of it? It's fairly straightforward. You need to carry out a risk assessment before the system is put into use. In, in identifying the risks associated with that system, you need to eliminate or reduce it. Um, if it's flammable, you need to classify the area where that refrigeration plant is going to be operated. Um, and EN 679 uh, gives you guidance on how to do that classification. Um, and then there's, beyond that, there's another raft of, of requirements within the regulation, which is that having done all of that, unless you can completely eliminate the risk, assuming you're not going to take an ammonia system out, you're going to continue to use it, you have to make arrangements to deal with accidents, incidents and emergencies. You need to inform and train staff. The last couple of days, uh, I've been in Thurrock and in St. Helens talking to sites that have big ammonia systems about what, what do you do in terms of your ammonia release responsing uh, plans. How, how, how's that structured? How have you educated and informed your own staff? What do you do about visitors that come in in terms of inducting them and letting them know you've got ammonia on site? Do they know what to do if the ammonia alarm goes off? All of that is a requirement under DESIR uh, to make sure all of that is in place if you're bringing this stuff onto site for the first time. Um, there's a requirement in terms of dealing with the, the risk, uh, again, specifically on ammonia, but on it's, well, no, it applies to all of them where uh, ventilation is one of the key methods for dealing with the risk associated with the flammability. If you can get ventilation going, um, you can uh, minimize the, the potential risk of a flammable condition arising uh, and therefore you can classify the area <coughs> appropriately according to that. Uh, 
the other requirements, you know, they're all the things you would expect to see, ventilation, leak detection, um, uh, emergency lighting and that sort of thing. Where do you go looking for <coughs> guidance on what that should look like? Um, EN378, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, gives you the, the requirements that you need to uh, comply with. In terms of the management of health and safety at work regulations, um, this again, the structure of what you need to do under this regulation is very similar to DSEER, and it's, it's, it's an important one with regards to toxicity and asphyxiation risks. So again, if you're putting a, a large volume refrigeration system, uh, say a uh, BRV type system within a, a building, you should be doing a risk assessment to say, if I lose all this refrigerant into this space, will it displace oxygen to a point where it might asphyxiate people? If the answer is yes, then you need to take steps to eliminate or reduce that risk. You need to make arrangements for dealing with accidents and incidents. You need to inform and train. Very similar to the requirements of DSEER. Again, uh, in the way that my team are dealing with looking at the risk of, say, ammonia installations, we actually look at both of these regulations as one uh, complete package and address uh, both the flammability and toxicity issues as one uh, one, uh, one document. And again, EN378 provides uh, direction in terms of how you, should, how you should deal with that. So, specifically on EN378, um, it addresses issues such as where refrigerants and refrigerant quantities can be used. So it classifies occupied spaces, uh, it, uh, it classifies outdoor areas and, and so on. It talks about the design of the machinery room, um, it, it addresses issues such as emergency showers where they're necessary. Um, it talks about refrigerant detection uh, and system concentration levels, occupancy requirements, maintenance, own and manuals. It's a very useful document um, and one that I had thought everybody in our industry would have known about, but interesting, I've had a conversation with somebody, uh, another contractor, uh, uh, where the individual said to me he'd never heard of EN378, which I found utterly astonishing. It's effectively our safety code bible and that's, uh, that's where you go to look for guidance on how to deal with the issues associated with flammability and toxicity. So EN378 is not, uh, is not the law, it's a, it's a safety code, it's a safety standard, but generally speaking it is recognised uh, and if you ran into problems with a system, let's say you had an explosion for reasons that I can't imagine. Uh, HSC, who would get very heavily involved at that point, would start asking questions like, well, provide me with the documentation to show that the system was designed in accordance with some recognized standard. And if you could point to EN378 EN as the basis for the design, then it makes life a lot easier. It is legally recognized as the basis for doing design. The Institute of Refrigeration provides codes of practice. Um, and there are other bodies such as the FSDF who have provided uh, recently, uh, 2016, an additional uh, information on safe management of ammonia refrigeration systems. There's a lot of information out there. There's uh, other organizations that publish good guidance uh, that it's worth taking on board. The International Institute of Ammonia Refrigeration, which is a US-based but international body, also provides a lot of uh, guidance on uh, safety standards, but also on, uh, more specifically, on design standards. So to summarize, more or less on time, um, it's like stating the blindingly obvious, but I think it's worth reiterating. Refrigeration systems need to comply with regulations. As I say, there's actually a whole raft of them, much more than the few that I've covered here in a very short space of time. But these are really key ones because these are the ones in relation to the, ref the refrigerants that we're seeing being used much more widely um, have a very kind of specific and profound uh, impact on them. So the Pressure Equipment Directive uh, for new or modified refrigeration systems, then there is this requirement. And that's a really important one. You need to, when you're looking at a system, if you're modifying it, ask yourself the question, does the PED, PER apply to this modification? Again, I think there's a lot of systems that are changed and modified where that isn't taken into account. And strictly speaking, you're breaking the law by making that change without carrying out the assessment under PED. PSSR and, and PUER 
are in-service regulations. Again, there's a, there's a requirement for documentation, there's a requirement for inspection, and it, it shouldn't be viewed as a burden in my mind. It should actually be viewed as a, a, a methodology for ensuring that your system remains safe to operate going forward. We, as a, we inspect, I think, probably about three or 400 systems a year under PSSR and PUER for clients and customers. And we are generally always finding issues that need to be addressed within that. And in many cases, it's the document that we produce is used as a basis for uh, ongoing improvements and maintenance uh, support. So it should be seen as a, a useful document rather than another piece of paper that's a burden. Um, Desire is important where you're working with flammable refrigerants. And as I've said, that includes the 2L refrigerants, which are ammonia and the new HFOs, um, and obviously the higher flammability uh, refrigerants such as the propanes. And the management of health and safety at work regulations, I've always felt that Desire isn't actually needed because the management of health, management, uh, of health and safety at work regulations actually should drive you to make the same assessment under risk if you know that your refrigerant is potentially flammable you would still be driven to do the same things as Desire is asking. But Desire is very sp specific on flammability and has the added requirement that you need to classify the area appropriately as either flammable, in which case you have to put in the appropriate electrical systems, uh, it's safe area, in which case you can carry on. Ammonia, you can't classify as a safe area if it's within a room. You need to do additional class, you, you need to do additional assessment that would allow you to classify it as a zone two of negligible extent, which allows you then to continue life under the guidance of the safety code EN378. That was an extremely quick romp through a whole pile of stuff. I suspect some of you might have been educated. Uh, some of you might have been entertained. I don't know. I leave you with that. And again, as Andy said, uh, if you have any questions, any uh, <coughs> thing you'd like to talk about. Dermot Cotter, who's my colleague based in Derby, um, can be approached, um, although I'm willing to answer any questions should you, should you be pushed to that. Okay, thank you very much.